Good afternoon, and welcome to the Johns Hopkins 30-minute COVID-19 briefing, where we provide live insights from the experts who lead our work at the Johns Hopkins Coronavirus Resource Center. For the next half hour, we'll focus on what you need to know right now about the COVID-19 pandemic and public health responses. We'll be offering these 30-minute briefings regularly on Fridays at 12 p.m. Some of you may have noticed that we have new intro music this week that was composed by our very own Dr. Brian Garibaldi. I'm Dr. Lainey Rutko, a professor at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, and I'm part of the leadership team for the Johns Hopkins Coronavirus Resource Center. We'll be providing answers in real time today, so please submit your questions in the box at the bottom of your screen. I'm joined by two guests. First, Beth Blauer, who's Associate Vice Provost for Public Sector Innovation at Johns Hopkins and the data lead for the Coronavirus Resource Center. Beth is going to talk about trends that we're seeing, especially in the demographic data. Then we'll hear from Dr. Bill Moss, who's the Executive Director of the Johns Hopkins International Vaccine Access Center and a professor at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Bill will give an update about COVID-19 vaccines. I'm now going to turn to each of our speakers for a brief overview. Beth, you have been immersed in COVID data for about 20 months now. At this point, what do you see as the most important lessons we've learned? Lainey, thanks, and thanks so much for having me today. Um, so I think there are a series of lessons that we've learned as it relates to COVID um, and the tracking that we've been doing for, COVID, for um, this work for the for the CRC and also as sort of the global standard bearer for how uh, we tracked and collect data on COVID. The first thing is, is that we need, um, we need some standardization. Um, I think there has been um, a real failure of the field um, to define how we measure and collect information around COVID. Um, and that has begged a larger question about the way that we standardize how we collect data across all public health measures. Um, what we've learned over the course of the last 18 plus months is that there is a real deficit when it comes to guidance um, on uh, how communication comes from entities like the World Health Organization or federal agencies like here in the United States, the CDC, on just really providing the kinds of supports that are necessary for public policymakers to really think critically about how they invest scarce resources in the public health. And so in um, the pandemic data initiative and the work that we've been talking about um, around kind of what we need to learn on the other side of this, I think the most hallmark learning is that we need a body, an organizing body that sets some standards that defines just really basic terms so that we can really navigate the, um, not just the, out of this pandemic, but also our collective public health. Um, it's begging also larger questions around what are the other missed opportunities when we don't speak common languages to think about rapidly deploying resources, um, scaling best practices in public health, and all the things that we know are critical in navigating some of the biggest challenges we face as a society. So I think top line, hands down, one of the biggest lessons and the lesson that I think we'll be talking about um, for you know many, many, many months, years to come as we uh, think about how we can take all of this collective experience and really apply it to uh, the future. I did just briefly wanna talk a little bit about what the data is looking like right now. So um, I know in the most recent briefings, we've been talking about pretty sustained case growth as it relates to Delta and the effects that Delta has had um, in the United States. I think there is some good news here. I think you're seeing in places that were really disproportionately affected by Delta growth, um, particularly in the Southeast region of the United States, we're seeing some declines in that data. Uh, and those that decline is seemingly holding, which means that we're seeing um, when we even out this data over time that um, we're starting to see that, that curve flattened. 
Um, where we're seeing case growth, we're seeing case growth in the Northeast Kingdom, um, probably deeply related to the fact that this time of year they get an influx of tourism in the Northeast Kingdom. So another important message to emphasize is that we got to keep investing in those mitigation practices, whether that's social distancing um, or uh, masking, and obviously, um, certainly uh, vaccination. Um, we're still seeing um, some really um, uh, 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 exponential growth in case while we saw some uh, noise in that data in um, Alaska, we're still seeing Alaska with case growth right now. Um, and that's as we look at it, I will say in the last few days, we're starting to see some of that data retreat. The data that we're looking at here in this graph um, on and, and on this map is actually uh, rounded out. So it's a two week view. So we saw a very steep increase and that is starting to retreat a little bit. Um, Want to call attention to the kind of Western side of the United States, um, where again, uh, we're still navigating the spread of, 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 um, of Delta and that um, where we've got um, the sort of deeper reds, that's where we're seeing case um, increases um, as we look at this with a two week average in mind. So uh, not out of the woods. Um, in terms of a global picture, uh, we know that um, uh, there are still regions in the um, around the globe that are significantly dealing with case growth, uh, especially as we look at um, Eastern Europe and the Middle East, um, and also a lot of Sub-Saharan Africa. They appear to be bearing the brunt of this most recent surge. Uh, and so um, especially in some of those places where the data is not um, uh, uh, consistently available, um, what we do have access to is leading us to believe that that's where we're seeing a lot of that case growth. So it's something we're still keeping a close eye look and also thinking about um, as we transition over to Bill, how do we start to really proliferate um, uh, vaccination dissemination so that we can get at some of these places that are continuing to really be navigating a, a health crisis. So uh, that, that's where we are. Um, and I'm going to hand it back over to you, Lainey. Thanks so much, Beth. Before I turn to Bill, I want to remind our audience, please submit questions for our experts, for Beth or for Bill, in the box that you see at the bottom of your screen. We'll move to Q&A um, after Bill finishes his remarks. So Bill, this week we've heard about the potential for boosters from Moderna and J&J. &J. Can you talk us through those developments? And, and also, I know folks are anxious to hear any updates about the timing for a vaccine for the 5 to 12 age group. Yes, thank you, Lainey. A lot going on. And as we speak right now, the advisory committee to the FDA called the Vaccines and Related Biological Products Advisory Committee is discussing the booster doses for the Johnson & Johnson. And I'll come back to that. But I thought I'd just start off, you know, reflecting a little bit about booster doses and, and what we're really talking about, what we're trying to do. Um, and I'll first start off by, by alluding back to what Beth said, you know, we, ha we have real luxury here in the United States that we're even talking about booster doses um, for uh, our communities when much of the global community uh, does not have access to vaccines. And this remains a, a vexing problem that needs to be addressed. And there, there are continuing efforts, including efforts announced recently by the Biden administration. But uh, so booster doses, first of all, are different than the third doses for which there already is uh, authorization for Pfizer and Moderna vaccines for individuals who are moderately or severely immunocompromised. These are individuals who are less likely to respond at all to two doses and for whom some of whom uh, will respond to a third dose. And it really gets down when we think about booster doses what is the goal of our vaccines? And uh, for those of you who, who were listening to the advisory committee discussions yesterday, you know, this came up uh, uh, over and over again. You know, are we with our vaccines, you know, trying to prevent moderate, uh, severe disease, hospitalizations and deaths due to COVID um, and really make this kind of a more mild disease uh, that we can live with, which I think is, is where we're trying to go, or are we really asking our vaccines to provide what is called sterilizing immunity, where they actually prevent infection and really stop transmission. And obviously we would like our vaccines, and they are, you know, contributing to the decreasing transmission that Beth talked about. 
Um, but it's very important that we have a clear idea of what our goal is with the vaccines as we talk about booster doses. When we have high levels of neutralizing antibody, and particularly antibodies on our mucosal surfaces, our immune system is going to be much more effective at, at uh, you know, pre preventing the spread of the virus uh, once it's entered our bodies and really minimizing any disease symptoms. Um, but those antibodies, those high levels of neutralizing antibodies in our blood are not going to last for a long time. We just cannot maintain that with these vaccines. So what's really critical are what we call our memory immune responses. And that kicks in, uh, you know, a few days later after exposure to the virus in a vaccinated individual. And that's what really protects us against severe uh, COVID. Um, so one of the questions that we ask when we're thinking about booster doses is, is there evidence of waning immunity? But it's very, we need to be very careful how we define that. What are we calling waning immunity? We are going to see decreasing levels of antibodies over time, but are we losing protection against severe disease? That's the real question. Um, and so with booster doses, we, we're asking, you know, we expect an increase uh, in, in the antibody levels, but are they really boosting our memory immune responses that protect us against severe disease? Are they actually offering that vaccine uh, effectiveness against severe disease? Can memory immune responses even be boost, uh, you know, be increased with these booster doses? We also want to know how these booster doses work across a diverse populations, whether it's race, ethnicity, across different age groups. Um, and uh, we also want to know the safety of these vaccines. Are there any increased risks of adverse events uh, if we're going to give booster doses? There also are a lot of outstanding uh, questions. How long does the protection last after a booster dose? What is the optimal timing of a booster dose? We've been talking about six months or more, um, but that's somewhat arbitrary. We don't yet know the optimal timing of the booster doses. And then should we be thinking about reformulated vaccines that, uh, that are targeted to the Delta variant, for example? This too came up in the discussions with Moderna yesterday, um, and they have been working on these uh, reformulated vaccines that specifically target the Delta variant. Um, and then lastly, as these advisory committees uh, and the FDA and CDC review the data, how much evidence is really necessary to make a decision in the face of a severe pandemic? Um, and so these groups are making decisions with imperfect data. Now, just to remind everyone what the process is that we're going through now with the booster doses with Moderna and Johnson & Johnson, you know, first it's this advisory committee to the FDA. They will make their recommendations. We saw their recommendations yesterday for the Moderna. We're going to hear it uh, this afternoon for Johnson & Johnson. Then the FDA, which usually uh, follows their advisory committee, um, will make their final determination determination on authorizing uh, the vaccine uh, for uh, specific populations, basically saying this, uh, the evidence shows safety and, and effectiveness. And then next week, what's going to happen is the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, which is the committee that advises the CDC, they're going to review the data, make their recommendations, and then ultimately uh, Dr. Rochelle Walensky will accept or modify uh, those uh, recommendations from the advisory committee. We saw last time that uh, she made changes uh, to the recommendations of the advisory committee with regard to booster doses for the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine. So uh, the ACIP is going to meet next week, uh, October 20th and 21st. I believe they're discussing this on October 21st. So very quickly, uh, to summarize the data from yesterday's discussion with regard to booster doses for the Moderna vaccine, again, another mRNA vaccine similar to the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. The, the most important data on or evidence suggesting that there's actually waning immunity that leads to loss of protection against severe disease comes out of Israel. So there was a lot of data presented from Israel um, on decreasing uh, vaccine effectiveness against severe disease with, the, um, with these vaccines. Um, 
Then the FDA reviewed the, the data that were presented by Moderna. This was somewhat limited. It included safety data and immunogenicity data. There was no e efficacy or effectiveness data from the, or efficacy data from the trials, but on a relatively small number of people, 171 immunocompetent, immunocompetent adults, 18 years of age, uh, or older, and they presented the results from an ongoing phase two trial. Very importantly, this trial looked at half the dose, the, the full uh, dose of Moderna vaccine is 100 micrograms. This is a, a 50 microgram uh, booster dose administered six months uh, or later uh, after completion of the primary series. And so they compared the, the antibody data with other groups, uh, that uh, other comparison groups, and with the original trial, and concluded that you got a, a better response with this booster dose. Again, we don't know for how long. The, uh, these are called immunobridging studies, where you try to bridge the immunologic data with the uh, clinical protection. Uh, again, relatively small sample size here, less than 200 individuals. They also looked at the safety data, and it's somewhat varied depending upon the signs or symptoms. The bottom line is they didn't see any uh, increased risks uh, of or safety signals following the, the booster dose. But again, small sample size, fairly short uh, duration of follow-up. But given the imperfect data, and so the, the committee is making decisions on imperfect data, they voted unanimously 19 to zero in favor of the FDA granting emergency use authorization of a half dose booster, a booster shot for the Moderna at least six months later uh, for three groups, individuals 65 years and older, everyone there, um, 18 to 64 years of age, for those who are at higher risk of severe COVID and uh, 18 through 64 uh, for individuals whose institutional or occupational exposure places them at higher risk of serious complications of COVID-19, uh, including severe COVID-19. And there was some discussion about the language of this last recommendation, but this is this very much parallels uh, the recommendations for the Pfizer booster dose. Um, the, at the end of yesterday's meeting, they had a discussion point, no voting, but really uh, you know, considered, should we be making booster doses available to, uh, to all adults older than 18 years of age? And in general, the discussion was that we're not yet at that point, um, particularly for younger adults who are at lower risk of severe COVID, um, that we do not yet need have the evidence base to suggest that uh, everyone, uh, all adults should be getting booster doses. Now, what's happening today, Lainey? Um, discussions around the Johnson & Johnson or Janssen vaccine. Um, I, I uh, had the opportunity to listen to much of the dis this morning's discussion. Um, there was an FDA briefing that came out that said that the data sets were not submitted in sufficient time for the FDA to conduct an independent review to verify the sponsor's analysis. So I just I highlight that because I want to point uh, out to people how careful these FDA reviews are. They don't just take the data, the summary of the data presented by the sponsor, they actually reanalyze the data. So what the FDA did in their summary, um, uh, they, they described a, a, a placebo-controlled trial looking at two doses of the J&J &J vaccine two months apart, saw uh, there is high, was higher efficacy than after a single dose, but again, the numbers were small, the number of cases were small leading to wide confidence intervals around these vaccine uh, efficacy uh, estimates. And the median follow-up was only 36 days after the second dose. So not strong data uh, presented by J&J &J in terms of uh, their uh, efficacy data. They also presented immunogenicity data, but again, relatively small sample sizes, um, relatively short duration of follow-up, and they used an assay that uh, the FDA complaint uh, uh, commented on was really uh, an exploratory assay and not validated. So questions there as well. With regard to safety, no, su sa no new safety signals, um, but uh, uh, really, uh, you know, again, small sample size and short duration. So at 1245 today, the committee is going to come just in a few minutes um, and come together and discuss and vote. I think this is going to be a very vigorous 
uh, a debate uh, about the Johnson and Johnson, but I, I, I'm very confident they're going to land on a on a recommendation that uh, individuals who receive the J and J, which are about 15 million people in the United States, should receive a second dose. Now, the the more controversial things, so there there will be a discussion uh, after that uh, with around results of a study from the NIH looking at mixed and mass approach. And the data, the preliminary data that were released suggests that um, those who got initially a Johnson & Johnson dose and then got a Moderna or even a Pfizer had a much higher uh, rise in antibody levels. So I don't think we're going to see a decision on this today, um, but this is a very important question. Should people who got the J&J &J vaccine get a, a, a second dose with an mRNA vaccine? And then lastly, Lainey, um, on October 26th, the same advisory committee to the FDA that's meeting today is going to meet uh, to review the data from Pfizer BioNTech on COVID-19 vaccines in children 5 through 11 years of age. Uh, so that's on October 26th. We'll go through the same process. ACIP is meeting November 2nd and 3rd. So I suspect we're going to see uh, recommendations on the use of the Pfizer BioNTech uh, vaccine in children 5 to 11 in the first week of November. Thanks so much, Phil. Before we move to q and I want to remind everyone who's watching, we do have a weekly newsletter that you can subscribe to called The Week in COVID-19. It is a great way to get the latest analysis from our experts about the virus, variants, and other critical trends to your inbox every Monday. So, Lots of questions coming in, no surprise there. And Bill, many of them have to do with vaccines. So I'm going to start with you. Um, in your remarks a moment ago, you talked about mixing and matching J&J &J and one of the mRNA vaccines. Any thoughts about the potential um, to mix the two mRNA vaccines? So if you got an initial series of Pfizer, is there a reason to think about getting a, a Moderna booster down the road? Yes, right now we we don't have evidence supporting you know mixing the two MNR, mRNA vaccines. They are very similar, but there also are differences, um, and we have seen some real world differences in the effectiveness. Some of those data are diff are are more challenging to interpret just because of the timing of the studies and the variants uh, that were circulating at a, at a different time. But I, I don't think we're going to end up with evidence suggesting that, uh, you know, mixing the two uh, mRNA vaccines as a recommendation. Now, the CDC does allow for that to uh, for for that to happen in situations where individuals cannot receive the same mRNA vaccine that they received for the primary series. Thanks, Bill. And sticking with you, what do we know about the potential for um, SARS-CoV-2 transmission from a one fully vaccinated person to another fully vaccinated person? Yes. Yeah, so, you know, these kind of transmission studies aren't aren't easy to do. Um, and, and so there's not going to be kind of a single answer to that question. But what I can say is that, you know, a fully vaccinated person um, is at much lower risk. Uh, should they become infected uh, with SARS-CoV-2 is at much lower risk of transmitting that virus. Um, the, the, that duration of what we call the infectious period, the duration at which they're uh, infectious is shorter. The amount of virus uh, in their nasal pharynx is, is lower. So they're going to be at lower risk of transmitting infection. And the vaccinated individual who comes into contact with that person is also going to be at lower risk uh, you know, of, of certainly, you know, getting uh, moderate to severe disease. Um, but depending upon, you know, kind of what their antibody levels are, what their immune response is, maybe the timing after vaccination, they may also be at, at lower risk of even getting mild, mild disease or even detectable infection. So you've got a lower risk of, of transmission and a lower risk of, uh, of getting infected with the exposure. And that combination creates uh, an even lower. The probability is not zero, but it's quite low. Thanks, Bill. Beth, can you talk about how we get the um, the vaccinated, the data about vaccinations, and and how um, granular are those data? So. Like all of our COVID data, we're pulling vaccination data from public data resources. And that means that we're pulling data directly from health departments, 
some from the CDC, uh, looking at the whole landscape of data that's available. So if you're a country and you're reporting that data, we're also pulling that data from the international community. The real challenge around the collection of vaccination data is that, again, it, there's a, a, a tremendous lack of standardization around how vaccination data is released to the public. And so that leads to a couple of different significant impediments. One, um, we're not able to do apples to apples comparison within the data set. So oftentimes we'll have states who are defining how vaccination data is released um, in ways that are not consistent with neighboring states or with other countries. So we don't get a full total comprehensive picture. And we have to do a bit of extrapolation when we're trying to understand how many people are vaccinated, have received one dose, have received booster doses. As we continue to add more layers of complexity on the way that we think about vaccination, the lack of standards is going to create even more confusion around who's vaccinated and kind of how much, how much more miles, how many more miles we have to go in, in really getting to the point where we feel like we have um, a, a, a community that's safe or, or protected from a vaccination strategy that's effective. Thanks, Beth. And Bill, we, we know with Pfizer that the, the booster is not a reformulation of the, the original um, Pfizer doses that folks got. Can, and you touched on this with, with Moderna, but can you explain again, how is the Moderna booster different? Yes. Yeah, so the, the, the Pfizer, uh, back, they're all the same formulation, meaning they're all, you know, using that genetic uh, sequence for the spike protein from that, that strain that was isolated in Wuhan. Um, and sequenced. Um, the Pfizer uh, primary series is a 30 microgram uh, of mRNA, and the booster dose is the same dose. Uh, that's also 30 micrograms for the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine. What's different here is a uh, having of the Moderna dose for the booster dose. Um, and so the, the Moderna primary series consists of 100 micrograms of messenger RNA. Uh, and that might, you know, that's pot a potential biological reason why some studies are suggesting, you know, higher uh, vaccine effectiveness with the Moderna vaccine. But the booster dose uh, that was just recommended yesterday by the advisory committee to the FDA um, is 50 micrograms. So half of that original, you know, uh, amount of, of messenger RNA, but still higher than what's in the, the Pfizer vaccine. Thanks so much, Bill. And that's going to be the last word for today as we're uh, close to 1230. So I'd like to thank Beth Blauer and Bill Moss for joining me today. Give a big thank you to everyone who joined and especially to those who submitted questions for our experts to answer. I should also thank Brian Garibaldi, who's not one of our experts today, um, but he should be thanked because he composed the new music that you heard at the beginning of this briefing. This briefing will be archived and available on coronavirus.jhu.edu. And as a reminder, we will offer these 30-minute briefings regularly on Fridays at 12 p.m. We'll be back next Friday, October 22nd at noon. I look forward to seeing you next week. And until then, thanks and stay safe.